currently finishing his first novel, Where the Jersey Devil Is. And I also just want to mention, uh, he's been a great teacher to me over the last 10 years. Michael Sager. <laughs> really nice to be home and to be here. I wasn't quite sure I was going to make it uh, 11 hour drive from San Francisco yesterday. Um, <laughs> maybe, <laughs> this doesn't count as part of my time. No, no. <laughs> you're right. Okay, so uh, um, I'm reading from something new. Uh, I'm sort of in this whole other universe finishing up my novel and I'm working on, when I have time, this, this new project. Um, some of you have heard some of this already, it's called Blood and Ink. Uh, Touch and murder mystery. Um, <laughs> cool. Um, and so, let's see, we're, we're about to like page 15 here, and what you know is that the narrator, Samuel, is a tattoo artist, and he's telling you that he's killed somebody, but he hasn't told you who yet, and that he's a Buddhist, and, um, <laughs> and that he's got this friend named Squiggy who's introducing him to this whole new world. And you also know that his mother died when he was a teenager and he raised his younger brother. So that's what you did. In 16 years of tattooing, you meet a lot of people. To say we get intimate is an understatement. Think about it. I'm causing someone focused pain in a controlled setting. Their bodies are telling them to fight or flight, and they can do neither. So the endorphin and adrenaline rush just fills the room with this weird kind of magic. It can get so intense. Sometimes the intention behind the tattoo and the person themselves are so focused and pure, I swear you can almost smell it. Ozone in the air before a lightning storm. That feeling of possibility and magic. I've tried to find a name that fits that feeling. I called it exponential at first. What is created between two people is greater than the either of them together. Then I called it magnetism, laws of attraction. Then quantum, that's how it felt, scientific, a fundamental energetic force of the universe. I would have called it the force, but Lucas already had that one sewed up. After I met Squiggy and all his friends, I settled on the word woo. Not my word. All those crazy hippie and queer pagans at the festival Squiggy dragged me to. However West Coast and strange I thought it was at the time, still, what a relief to know that I was not the only one who knew about the mystical shit that goes down when people come together with the intention of making some kind of connection. When the, when the woo shows up, I know I'm in for a wild ride. I know I have to pay close attention. I'm the lightning rod, the center. The client is relying on me to hold it all together. The tattoo room becomes its own little universe. It can get hairy in there, what with the woo and the pain and the ink and the blood. Anything can happen. The truth gets told. People pass out or puke. We bond. Believe me, I've gotten more, more intimate with some of my clients over tattoos than I have with sex partners during or after sex. A magician's path. I've made a career out of it. Not the bonding. That's just a fringe benefit. And a job hazard, sometimes. Comes with the territory. You'll see. Just you wait. No. I'm talking about the lightning storm, a magical summoning for the client to mark their purpose in their skin and infuse it with woo. Trying to define woo is difficult, but it's important you understand what I'm trying to get at. If you're going to believe that I'm capable of what I'm going to tell you that I've done, you have to understand this part of what I do and how I was doing it long before Squiggy ever even came on the scene and wrapped me up in all his drama. The first time I felt the woo, 1985. 17 years old. Joshi, my little brother, was 11. I remember our ages. I remember the day exactly, the day I gave my first tattoo. Pops wasn't home. He did that sometimes, went in on a bender, stuck on a bar stool somewhere. It's amazing to me now that Pops was able to hold down his security guard job at all, but that's the only thing Pops ever held on to again after Mom died. And that's all I know how to talk about Pops in those days. Once Joshi died, once I killed him, it was different. Me and Pops had lots to say to each other. My brother Joshi, the first person I killed. Not murder, not art, just fucking misery. But before all that, 1985, when I came home from school that day, there was Pops' note and some money for groceries on the kitchen table. Samuel, I won't be home for a few days. Take care of your brother. Me and Joshi were fine whenever Pops was gone. 
the house worked better if Pops was completely absent, as opposed to the usual of Pops just being absent in his head. As a matter of fact, I was waiting for Pops next bender, waiting for my chance to get Joshi alone. And when I saw that note, that was it. I was filled with the thrill of meeting my destiny. I knew it was going to be great. Oh, I was going to take care of my brother, all right. As soon as I read that note, I was on it. I ran down the hall to my bedroom to get my tattoos set up together. I sat cross-legged on my bed with a towel spread out in front of me and my old lunchbox from when I was a kid, covered with pictures from that old TV show, The Six Million Dollar Man. So when I got older, of course, that became my Six Million Dollar Stash Box. I filled it with clippings from tattoo mags and my favorite drawings of tattoos I wanted and the most glorious tattoo setup I could have imagined at the time. My favorite clipping I got from an old biker tattoo man, a picture of my idol, the artist and tattooist Greg Irons. He was at some convention in California and he was smiling. The photo was grainy but was filled with his big woo because behind him, behind Greg Irons, you could see his whole tattoo setup. All the machines and the needles and the tubes and the ink and the power supply. I dreamed of being like Greg Irons, an artist who traveled the world and put his art on people's bodies. I was hooked. I got tattoo mags from ga the gas station every month when they came out. And once I even took a bus to the convention center in Philly. Greg Irons wasn't there, but I saw a bunch of old tattoo guys, all those macho fuckers tattooing and getting tattoos, bikers and long hairs, watching them laugh and joke, and sometimes wincing a little if the needle was going over someplace sensitive, like their wrist or their ribs. I just skulked around, totally fucking clueless, but that's when it got inside me, the longing for the ink. I wanted that mystery and the magic that those guys seemed to hold already. Pain seems such a small price to pay. I wanted the woo in my skin. Let's be clear, though. My pathetic homemade materials and setup looked nothing like Greg Irons. No vendor at any of the conventions would even think about selling a kid like me a real tattoo machine. Hell, maybe it's because back then I still called them guns. I heard about turning an electric toothbrush or a Sony Walkman motor into a mini tattoo machine. Apparently, that's how they did it in prison. I figured someday I would learn how to make those, you know, just in case. I knew how to tattoo. I watched all those guys at the convention, and Kathy Rosen at school, one of the goth, goth girls that sat near me in the homeroom and listened to The Cure all the time, she told me all about how her older boyfriend gave her her secret tattoo that she said she couldn't show me because she made her promise. Those goth girls and their secret pains and promises. <laughs> but she did tell me about how he did it, and for that I'll love her forever. How you boil the needle in a saucepan for a little while, then wrap it in thread and eraser end of a new pencil, and you cut a little groove into the eraser so the needle wedge is in there real tight. Now don't be a schmuck and try to stick the needle into the eraser, it won't work. Just lay the needle against the pencil, and in that groove, leaving about an inch poking past, then wrap the whole thing real good with thread. Just wrap that fucker till it's held tight. And make sure to wrap down the needle, just leaving an eighth of an inch with the needle tip exposed. That way, when you dip it in the ink, the thread will absorb the ink and keep it flowing for you. Man, oh man, I couldn't wait. And of course, Joshi, my little bro. Two memories of Joshi that stay inside me, the way he still lives in me, like he's been tattooed into the underside of my skin from the inside. The first one, the memory I try to never remember, but I will never forget. The white ghost of his skin, his eyes roll back in his head, drool and a single drop of blood out the corner of his mouth. The way his neck rolled funny when I picked him up. Joshi, my Joshi, I'm so sorry. Whenever that picture comes in my head during waking hours, I immediately switch. I can't go there, I won't go there. If anything, I'm my father's son. I am a survivor, and sometimes to survive, you have to force yourself to forget. No, Joshi, the good memory. 1985, Pop's gone, and we had a whole weekend alone together. The way that dude looked when he first got home. My God, I loved him. But you don't know that's what it is when you're 17 years old, and this is the only thing standing in your way of your destiny is your kid brother. The way he looked up at me, curly Italian dark hair, long and thin and strong arms and legs, wiry, wary, eyes kind of like Squeaky's eyes, dark and hurt somehow. Joshi knew something I didn't. Joshi was no survivor and couldn't turn off any of what he felt inside. I would give my whole world to save you, Joshi. Joshi was in his sweats from his junior high basketball game, a long red sports shirt of that breathable fat fabric with the sleeves cut off. That kid was all job cool, kind of a superstar at school. 
And here's the kicker, what I wish I could change besides the fact of his death. The only place Joshy wasn't a superstar was with me and Pops. We never let him be. Pops because Joshy had more of mom in him than I did, and me because I guess I always wanted to take him down a peg or two just because I could. I took him down all right. That little fucker didn't stand a chance. Soon as he was up the stairs and dropped his backpack by the couch I was on and You have to help me, I said. It wasn't a question. Joshy always knew when he was on the spot. Hyper vigilant, you might call it. Little brothers. They want to believe in you because they know it could be as glorious as you always say it will be, or as humiliating or painful as things generally turn out. Well, of course he gave in. Joshy knew all about my tattoo dreams. He was really into it. And when I told him he was going to be my first, those dark eyes of his, those dark eyes of his lost the hurt look and got really excited. I couldn't believe it. He was proud to be my first. We decided to strap his arm down with one of Dad's old leather belts, just in case it hurt real bad. I knew it was important that he didn't move at all, that if he moved it could really mess up the tattoo. But he was perfect. Thank God I have that picture of him and us in my head to blot out the other picture of him, the ghost skin, his eyes rolled back, a spot of blood. It took me hours. He was all macho fucker himself though, just like those guys at the convention. I was so proud. Both of us sweating from the intensity and the concentration. My arm and hands touching him all over his arm, stretching his olive skin tight, poking over and over again with my pencil needle, dipping ink, poke, wipe, repeat, again and again, repeat until your little brother's armpit looks like hamburger and is swollen and red and bleeding. But Chashi didn't say a word, hardly looked at me, went zen and stared off into space. My brother, the woo. It was there, in the room with us, singing all around us. I knew that day. I knew that magic. I knew for real at the front of my mind that this is what I was born for, that I was here to touch people and mark them in an ancient and deep way. Maybe not in those words. Too many words for back then. The words came later, just recently. Me in prison with plenty of time to think about words. Joshi wanted my initial. A letter S in black up under his arm near his pit so Pops wouldn't see. Pops did see it two years later. 1988, the coroner showed it to him. But no, not yet. I can't go there yet. 1985, stay in 1985. Joshy looking in my eyes, the curly hair, the muscle in his neck and chest and arms, the way Pop's black leather belt pressed into Joshy's wrist. You, Joshy said. I want a piece of you. Give me the S. I was fucking floored. I was gonna refuse, and then I realized how simple and easy an initial would be. I was scared, even from the start, especially at the start. I didn't get it yet. The thing about woo and intention and meaning, that this is what he wanted in his skin forever. A reminder of me, his brother, his protector. What a laugh. Right there, right there I knew. I knew, I much, I knew how much I loved my brother, how I would do anything for him. Exponential, magnetic, quantum. Woo was more than magic. Wu was love. My brother and I, bound together by more than just blood. Ink, too, that held us. Blood and ink. A little bit of my intention pushed into him and absorbed into his body through some magical process. The mystery of life and health transmuted into flesh, held there for as long as his mortal body lived. Ghost skin, eyes rolling back in his head. Oh, my brother, love and magic. Wu. The word made flesh. Sometimes even our best intentions aren't enough. <laughs>